Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Sportscaster and Her Son, where sports bridges the gap between the generations. I'm your co-host, 12-time Emmy Award-winning sportscaster from Chicago, Peggy Kaczynski, now at ESPN Radio in Chicago. I'm the mom, the sportscaster, and the baby boomer. Right, Chase? Yes, mom. And I am the other co-host. I'm the son. As you can tell, it's, I just called her mom. Uh, my name is Jason Commander. I'm a junior at the University of Texas at Austin. Aside from being the co-host of this wonderful show, I'm involved with Texas Student Television as well as with my own writing. So uh, glad to be here. Glad to preview the Bears season. Thank you, everyone who has followed us on YouTube, our website, thesportscasterandhersun.com, and those who are listening to us on ESPN Radio Chicago app. Please continue to download, follow, tell your friends now that we are on the ESPN Chicago app, our new home. And don't forget, fan merchandise is available at our store on T Public. You can check out that link. You can see it below scrolling if you're watching us on YouTube. Otherwise, you can actually get the link off of the website, the sportscaster and your son.com. And Jason, yes. one more one more thing to add, Mom, that you uh, keep forgetting to push. We do have a Twitter now. It is at T S A H S pod dot uh, just at T T H A S H whatever. You know, the, the acronym for the show. Uh, that's where we post clips from the shows, post some previews, always post the latest shows, where to find the show if you can't. Uh, find it on the app. So great follow. Be sure to follow our new Twitter. Lots of cool stuff going on over there. T-S-A-H-S pod on Twitter. Yes. Yes. And we'll say it again in the outro. (laughs) Jason, you mentioned it in this episode, the Bears. It's the beginning of the 2022 season. They are embarking on a whole new season here. And wow, changes that have been made. Ryan Poles comes in as the general manager, first time general manager coming from the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, He has $12 million in cap space available, ninth most in the NFL, Uh, $90 million though cap space projected in 2023, which could be the most in the NFL. So what does that mean? He's deconstructing the team. He let some big ticket players go or through trade, Khalil Mack, Akeem Hicks, Allen Robinson. Uh, He has future draft capital now with a less talented team. And um, we're not quite sure what to expect from the players that he has on the field. He does still have Robert Quinn. He does still have Roquan Smith, who did not play in any preseason games after a hold in. He was held out of the last game due to some tightness. So there's a lot of questions about this team up in the air. And oh, by the way, there's a new head coach, Matt Eberflus. You know, I think that the two biggest things to watch for this Bears season, number one is the new coaching staff and the new regime. How do the new players look? How does the new system look? How does the effort look? How does the response after a big win, after a blowout loss, how does that all compare to the Nagy regime? Because all those things were so scrutinized, especially in the last season. So the fans and, of course, the front office will be looking for a much different feel um, from really the second that the team steps on the field on Sunday. The other big thing for me and for everyone else in Chicago is the progression of Justin Fields. We all know that NFL quarterbacks, usually year two is the most telling year. You know, if you have a franchise guy, a future pro bowler, or somebody who looks to be a boss, maybe we won't get that answer from Justin Fields because the nature of the offensive line, Bears didn't make any big ads to the offense as my ring light goes out. I'll put that back on in a moment. Um, But Justin Fields' progression will be big because the Bears have spent that capital to make him the next franchise quarterback. And regardless of who's on the field with him, how he plays will be a big factor factor in how the bear season pans out to be. And what's interesting is one of those new hires for Matt Eberflus is Luke Getze as the offensive coordinator coming over from Green Bay, where he worked with Aaron Rodgers. And um, this is an offense that everyone is hopeful is going to put not only Justin Fields in the best position to succeed, but the rest of this team as well, because they might be limited on skill players. When the roster, the 53 man roster was announced and finalized, Jason, this is so crazy. The average age of the roster actually got younger to 25 years old. Doesn't surprise me. Well, it sounds young, but that was still 23rd in the league. 23rd in the NFL with the average age of 25. This tells you the NFL is a young man's game. Well, so after waiver claims, the Bears made seven pickups after the 53-man roster was uh, was set. 
seven pickups. The average age dropped as well, and they moved up to 15 spots, which is like eighth then in, in the league. So it was crazy. It, it, it was really amazing how much Ryan Poles is trying to get younger and at the same time doesn't want to get any of his players killed on the field by you know not having guys that can finish an NFL game. So it's going to be an interesting season for sure. I, you know what I want to add really quick is that number about the Bears average age. You know what that really is an indicator of is how few draft picks one they've had with the Justin Fields trade and two they've retained. I mean, the mm-hmm. Ryan Pace draft history gets worse by the cut day each year. I mean, first round picks, second round picks, day two picks, day three picks. I mean, it's bad. And uh, I think that that's kind of reflective of just how many times the Bears missed on their young players. And, I mean, they need to get it right because some of the best teams in the NFL have been able to do this quick turnover from drafting correctly. It is a young players league, especially on offense. So the opportunity is still there if they're not going to win more than six games. They can still make waves and make progress this year and put themselves in a good position to add more pieces and get the Bears back to what they should be in Chicago. So here's the numbers, Jason. Only four of 32 draft picks from 2015 to 19 uh, of Ryan Pace are actually still with the Bears. That's just up to 2019. Uh, And the only veteran free agents from the Pace regime are like um, Robert Quinn, uh, Cairo Santos. I mean, it's crazy. Here's the guys that are still with the team. Patrick Scales, long snapper. Cody White here on the offensive line. He's playing left guard. Um, Andre Houston Carson, one of the defensive backs. Um, Eddie Jackson, who had a great first two years, earned a huge contract and really dipped off the last two seasons. Um, Roquan Smith, who had his hold in, wants a big contract. So he's actually playing for a big contract this year. Uh, David Montgomery, Sam Mustafer, who suddenly was thrown into uh, center, although he did finish a couple games at center last year. Um, center, and that was after there was Lucas Patrick had a hand injury early in uh, camp. And then um, Quinn, Komet, Johnson, Mooney, Gibson, Vildor, S- Santos, Fields, Jenkins, and over the last two years. So it is a young team. It's uh, a lot of turnover. And what's interesting, when I was in the locker room this week, a lot of the guys talked about they're hungry, uh, and they have a chip on their shoulder because they want their they want their their contracts. Jalen Johnson wants a contract extension. David Montgomery wants his contract extension. Darnell Mooney, Cole Darnell Komet. Mooney, uh, Cole Komet, Justin Roquan Fields Smith. eventually, and Justin Fields exactly. Yeah. So they they they're playing with a chip on their shoulder. And these other guys, many are on one year contracts because they're they truly are playing for a longer term contract, if not with the Bears next year, then with someone else. So who's in charge of motivating this group of guys? None other than Matt Eberflus came over from the Indianapolis Colts and now is in charge of the general on the field. But I would tell you after watching training camp, He is more like a CEO running an organization, the way he deals with all the different units. He is in the offensive meetings as much as he is in the defensive meetings. He gives his coaches a lot of space to coach. He set the foundation. He set the principles. And it is the hits principle that he has uh, brought into Chicago. And this is really where it all begins. And that's with Matt Eberflus and You may not have been sold on him right off the bat, but I'll tell you what Ryan Poles was because he was asked about him this past week and Ryan Poles, the general manager said, I love that dude. (laughs) You know, it's really nice to see just positivity around the GM and head coach positions. I mean, last year it was nonstop with the Nagy and the pace. And I mean, we all know how bad it got to the the point of people chanting at Nagy's son's football game. And it's nice to hear the sweet talk. I just hope that it, it translates to the field and a big theme of the season is going to be sometimes a win might not be a W in the win column. It's going to be about these baby steps, these little signs, these signs of growth, especially in young players. It's a young team with guys looking for new contracts, guys that the bears are banking on to be the next faces of the franchise. So even if it's not going to be a playoff competing season, it still is just as important of a season for the bears as any. 
Jason, let's bring in our guest, Matt Eberflus's mentor, former Bears defensive coordinator from 2009 to 2012, also defensive line coach, former Lions head coach. I mean, he's got so many years of experience in the NFL. You can see why Matt Eberflus looks up to him so much. Rod Marinelli is joining the podcast right now. Coach, how are you? I'm great. Fantastic being with you. My well, it, it's always good when you're retired, isn't it? <laughs> well, you, you kind of. And uh, no, it gives, this has it, been great. Yeah, it, great it, time it, with my wife, and, and it's all good. I love it. So we want to talk to you about Coach Eberflu. So, you know, he has so much yep. respect for you that he turned down a promotion with the Cowboys to take over the defense out of respect for you who was holding the job at the time. And that's when he ended up going to the Indianapolis Colts. How did you and coach Eberflus uh, bond so much back from your days in Dallas? You know, it was great. And, uh, the first year we were there together and uh, Monty Kiffin was there. He was a coordinator and then me and Matt, a couple of guys on the staff. And then I took over the following year and uh, it just, the things we do and the things we believe in was a match early and how we did things. And uh, I think it intrigued him a little bit and it's his personality. I mean, this, what we do on defense is his personality. So when he took this job here in Chicago, was there ever a thought for you to join his staff? You know, it would have been, you know, it's special. But I, I felt at the end of last year, I uh, needed to step back for a year at least and uh, spend this time with my wife and family and my grandkids or going to college and all that stuff. So I had a chance to go do that. And you said a year at least. So you're not ruling out a possible return to coaching for any team in the future. Well, I, you're right. I mean, I'm just uh, I go day by day. Once the year is over, then I'll I kind of refocus what I want to do. You know, I can relate to that because that's sort of what my mom did, actually, when she stepped back from NBC in 2016. Initially, yeah. it was, I'm going to fully retire, and then it was, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this. And now, six years later, my mom's <laughs> just about as much in it as, as when she started. So <laughs> you talked about, really quick, you talked about those coaches, and Eberflus is somebody who yeah. you have a lot of experience coaching with. You have coached with some of the greatest coaches, defensive coaches especially, in the history of the NFL. Tony Dungy, Lovey Smith. Um, Mike Tomlin, what yeah. qualities did those coaches have when they were assistants that make them great head coaches or made them great head coaches? That's really a great question, you know, because uh, there's a lot to that. And I think it all started, it kind of came down through uh, Coach Dungy and the system we brought in and we hadn't won, I think we hadn't had a winning season in 20 years in Tampa at that time. And there is a certain steadiness and belief and you can do things a lot of different ways but there we only did it one way and uh, we believed in that how we believed in it and it took us a year and a half and then it kind of kicked but uh we had good players we didn't know it then but we they were coming and uh, it, it's that confidence but i believe in anything you do it's got to be belief you got to believe in what you're doing and then the players will believe it. This defense is so perfect for Matt Eberflus because it's oh, yeah. so the Tampa two is so detail oriented. Yes. Um, you got to get the push and the penetration up front. You have yes. to take away the lanes from the running backs, and then the linebackers just have you know cleanup duty pretty much. Yeah. Matt Eberflus, coach, might be the most organized coach that I have covered. And when I started in Chicago, I started Mike Ditka's final week coaching the Bears. Uh -huh. uh, then I covered Dave Wanstead, Dick Geron, uh, Lovey Smith, Mark Tressman, John <laughs> Fox. <laughs> so I've seen six head coaches for the Chicago Bears and now Matt yeah. Eberflus. I am so impressed with he is a CEO of this yeah. organization. He really, yeah. he really has given all of his coordinators and his coaches what he wants them to do, what their principles are, and he sits back and he lets them coach. Is yeah. that the kind of man that you saw as well? Oh, no question. And that, that, that's what a head coach should do, in my opinion. 
that you know you train you coach your coaches in the off season to exactly what you want done how you want it done drills all those things your basics then you allow their personalities in the classroom and how they coach on the field but within there there's parameters about effort and tackling and all those basic things people let those basics go now you once you've laid that down that foundation you got a chance for a, a good haul for the rest of the season but no he's got intelligence and he's smart and the work ethic is really good and the system's all about details and the foundation that he has brought to chicago is his hits principle yeah so it's the hustle intensity takeaways and playing smart he yep. says that he used his words to come up with the principle but he got the idea from you and watching how you coached defensive line, uh, how you were incredibly detailed and you can grade uh, not just in practice, every play, every snap, and not just, you know, on their assignments, but on the principles of what you're trying to teach. Are you hustling? Uh, are you loafing? Are you playing intense? Are you getting the takeaway? Are you swarming to the ball? He grades every part of it. Yeah. Do you know where in your coaching background you started becoming very detail oriented with how you would coach? You know, uh, really started with Coach Dungy, but I'd even go a step back um, when college football. I coached for John Robinson at USC and uh, Bruce Snyder at uh, Arizona State and Cal, both incredibly detailed. I mean, in, in that era, it was everything being physical, uh, being great teachers on the field, how you did things as a coach, examining your words that you use, repetitive words, your drills and your structure is everything. Now, there's different ways to do it. You can throw a lot of defenses in and trick people, and, all, and that's all good. But in this system, you can't vary. You have to have such belief, and I think the hardest part First, one, he hired really good guys who he'd been with, too. And Travis was with me, and uh, Travis Smith was with me in uh, Vegas for a couple of years, and he's sharp as a tack, too. So he understands what Matt wants. And then the, the key to the whole thing, you, a player or a coach can never walk by a mistake. Mm. And that's what it's all. If you're going to be detailed and you're going to be on it, you can't walk by mistakes. And it's hard because at times you go, oh, man, I'll call this guy out again. Well, so be it. And uh, that's just the way it is. Jason, let me jump in real quick because Coach Eberflus constantly reminds the media of that, that the coaches must stop and you must correct immediately yes. when a mistake is made. And you yeah. don't let it go. You have to recognize it. You have to tell them then and then you move on. And yes. players do seem to be like they are responding to that kind of teaching, really. You would, you would, no question in my mind, when a player understands your beliefs, I've said this before, one of the key words in all of football is the word why. Why do we do something? First, the coach, the teachers got to articulate it exactly in short words to the player. And when it's clear to the player, there's clarity. When there's clarity, there's speed, and there's quickness, and there's instincts. It all fits together. So, okay, so you're talking about this word why. I think the biggest, the, the toughest thing for me to wrap my head around with this Bears season is the mentality going in because a franchise like the Bears, 85, 90% of the years are going to come in competitive, trying to win, but this year's a yeah. little different. So even though you have the coaches that are trying to hammer these points, you still have players, especially veteran players, who might be looking at the season and say, you know, what do I have to play for? So what is that why for the players on a team that might not be competitive this year? You know, I would say that why, why you're here is to earn your salary. It's a man's world. And that league is a man's league. And you earn your salary. That's number one. And then you're playing for a team and a franchise and coaches all together. And that's a man's job. And I think you point those things out. I have something I've done. I know Matt's doing. You build the man first. Then you build a player. And once you build that man, 
okay, man building, whatever. And that's why I like tough practices. These, it's, it, it's got to be hard and you've got to survive. And what you're doing is preparing to build your armor in the off season training camp, build your armor for the season. And uh, in this system, if you don't build your armor, it's not going to be good now because you're counting on whipping somebody's, you know, you're counting on whipping the man that you're supposed to play. You have to do it with great skill and technique. One of the biggest elements of Bears rebuild, reload, whatever you want to call it, is that, you know, this takes time. And I think that what Bears fans just want to see this year, we know that there won't be the wins that there have been in past years. But I think that Bears fans can all agree that they just want to see elements that are way different than the past coaching regime. So what elements Mm -hmm. do you think that we can see, particularly on the defense, that will be different from last year's team, even if it doesn't immediately translate to wins in year one? Yeah. You know, and they play, they've played good defense over the years. You know, they have done a good job. But I, I think the thing you've got to be able to see is the hustle. The hustle is morale. If you have great morale, you've got an opportunity to compete in every game. And if the hustle isn't there, the morale isn't there to me, in my opinion. Okay. My belief. And so you see the morale tackling is to me a sign of great discipline and great teaching especially in the year, finishing blocks up front. The very, you win by doing the ordinary things a little bit better than your opponent. Game in and game out for the long term. And if you can focus on yourself and having a chance to build your skill, when your skill is built, there's morale because you feel good about yourself and you're developing as a player. So that morale hopefully carries through the year, and I believe it will. I, before you before you ask your follow up, Mom, I just want to say I think that's great advice for life in general. That if you commit yourself to something, and if your morale's high, and if you really want it, you can achieve it, and you'll be positive about it. I think that's really good life advice, just just in general. Yeah, and the opposite side of it is when things don't go well. So hopefully you've developed that morale in the man, real men, that can take a bump on the head and keep going, and doesn't affect your morale that's that's the key and when everything's going good morale's pretty good you just led me exactly what i was thinking as well coach (laughs) and that was a lot of the outside noise about the chicago bears they're being picked as one of the you know if you depends on who you read are they the the worst team in the nfl are they the third worst team in the nfl they haven't played a game yet but everyone is saying just how bad of a team they are going to be And in a league in which it is win now, this is not, it could be a very difficult year. So why is Matt Eberflus the right person to lead this team through what Jason was just talking about, the rebuild? Yeah, I I think it takes strength, mental strength and conviction and belief in what you're doing. The players will see that. And you, you got, you got to be strong and say, I, I'm not going to change because I believe in what we're doing. Now you got to add a little sugar and salt and some of those things over there as you're going. But this principles that you've introduced to the players at the very beginning, they've got to see that you're going to stand by them and not let them falter. Good times, bad times. And you got to correct and move forward. You teach, correct, move forward. Coach, how often do you talk to Matt Eberflus? Oh, God, I either drop them a note, you know, or I short calls. I'm I'm big. I mean, I uh, short and to the point and I'll drop maybe a couple of times a week and then a, maybe a couple of messages. Things to think about as you're going on, which he knows sometimes, you know, you, you forget something or something like that. But just be who you are to me and then you'll enjoy it. If you're trying to be somebody else, you're not going to enjoy the process. But the pro- it's a hard process. And uh, you have to have hard men. Your coach has got to be hard. And then in turn, the player's got to be hard. And uh, that's the beauty of our game. That should never change. That's the beauty. Before we let you go, Rod Marinelli is joining us here on the Sportscaster and Her Son podcast. Uh, Coach Eberflus said that you are really great at recommending books to read. Yeah. 
and Matt Eberflus is a big reader up until oh, yeah. spring training or spring training training camp starts. He yeah. reads, uh, he told me he reads multiple books at one time, which yeah. I don't have that kind of focus. I have to start one book and finish one book. So coach, tell me what book or books you told him he should read after taking the job in Chicago. Boy, I mean, we have done this all our, for about seven years in Dallas. So he's read from John Wooden, who's just a teacher, you know, to Chuck Knox's book. It came out just masterminds of simplicity. Coach Dungey's book, those are all. And then I always like to go off and see different type of coaches that may be a little bit different than me. So you got a chance to see the full perspective. And then great leaders in our history, I think, uh, in the history of this country, that uh, it's all the same. You got to take a belief and lead men. Well, I sent him the book because I heard about your little book club that you former Dallas coaches have together. So yeah. I sent him the book, Cracking the Code, which was Ooh. based on the Ryder Cup team that finally beat the, the Europeans for the United States title and Great. how they, they actually put the team together and how they coached, you know, the guys, do you put two guys who are similar together? Do you put guys who are opposite that can help e even each other out? So, and knowing that he's also a golfer, I sent him that book and, <laughs> and another one on the city of Chicago, just so he knows the city that he's in now. Yeah. He's going to find out soon. Exactly. It's, foot, it's football and it's hitting. Yeah. What's your what's your best advice to him uh, in just being in Chicago itself, the, the media, the, the fans, mm -hmm. the city itself? I, I think it's poise. I pick poise over panic. OK, there's two points, poise and panic. And I've always picked poise. So you can always have poise when you know exactly what you're doing and media comes in, you can explain to them why you did this you know because it's part of our progression on how we do things and then i think you you become who you are the real part of who you are to the media mm -hmm. they may not like the answer that's okay but it's your belief and it's it's all poise no panic panic players see it that means you start changing everything and we got to do this now no, you don't do that. Poise. I love it. Coach Rod Marinelli, thank you so much for taking the time to join yeah. us. And uh, maybe we'll see you in Chicago again soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I love it. And uh, I just really appreciate it. Great questions. Great. Jason, great job. Thank and, you. Uh, it, you make the game better with good questions. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Okay. I got to tell you. Rod Marinelli is very impressive. He really is. His The whole thing about don't panic, that's exactly how he handled himself through the Lions winless season. I mean, it's, exactly. it's very interesting, his insight and his influence on Matt Eberflus. And, you know, had we had more time with Coach Marinelli, I certainly would have asked him about that 2008 Lions team because you would have never been able to tell that he was the head coach of that particular team. But the wisdom that he gave us was so reflective of somebody who has been on all types of teams, Super Bowl staff, playoff staffs, the staff of the worst team in NFL history. All that wisdom combined to hear him talk so highly about Coach Eberflus can't help but make me excited. All right, Jason, you have some predictions? Three predictions. These are going to be quick. They're all Chicago Bears related because the season begins on Sunday. So here we go. Number one, of course, related to Justin Fields. I'm going to predict that Justin Fields makes a sizable jump this year. Not sizable enough to make a Pro Bowl. Sorry, there's just not the type of offensive weapons around him. But I do think that at the end of this year, here's my prediction with this one. There will be no doubt in the mind of Bears coaches, fans, and those around the league that Justin Fields is the answer at quarterback. It might not have anything to do with the win column. It might not even have very much to do with the stats at the end of the day. But I think that he's going to show the growth and the understanding and commitment to the system necessary to keep him around and dedicate Bears fans to cheering for him and dedicate him to uh, being the next quarterback face of the franchise of the Bears. Here's number two. Of the so Arlington two, Bears. Of the Arlington Bears. The Arlington Bears. <laughs> the Arlington Bears. Very, very interesting. Okay. 
So number two, I am going to go with a little bit of a surprise here. We heard some mumbles from training camp. I want to say it was two weeks ago, not training camp practice, that uh, the Bears didn't really feel great about David Montgomery as a fit in their system. Well, I'm going to predict that Khalil Herbert by the end of the year will be running back one. But I don't think it's going to be as much because Montgomery isn't a great fit in the system. I just really love Khalil Herbert. I think he showed a lot last season. I think that he showed that he could be a big play back, but he can also be reliable. And as a late round gem, one of the last late round gems of the pace era, I think that Khalil Herbert is going to have a lot of opportunities to make plays. We saw Luke Getze's offense last year utilizing a two running back set. Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, both very different, but both got a lot of touches. I think we could see something similar with Montgomery and Herbert, but I love Herbert's running style, and I think that this season is going to give him the opportunity to uh, have a bigger role on the Bears come next season. So I do think number two. And I do think that a lot of NFL teams are proving that Chiefs included, which is where Ryan Poles came from, are proving that they can rotate running backs in and out every two to three years without having to pay the big money. If you have good coaching, you have good skills, you have a good offensive line, then you can get a different running back in there every three years without yep. having to pay the huge money. And that's why you don't see running backs go in the top 10 or even in the first round right. anymore because they're so dispensable. Okay, so my third prediction here, and, uh, you know, I try not to get as caught up in stuff like this um, just because, you know, it's uh, it, it doesn't really matter for this year's Bears team, the whole, you know, record prediction and all that. But I did take a look at the schedule today. I've taken a look at it in the past. But people had asked me, look, what do you see the Bears doing this year? And I've never really, like, thought too hard about the question this year because, like, I can't say like 10, like 10, seven, people are going to be like, Oh, you're an idiot. So my bears prediction, I took a look at the schedule and I see zero guaranteed wins. So with that being said, I think it's going to be a positive year in Chicago, but I'm going with four wins mm. that will line the bears up for a top five pick and will set next year up to be a very interesting year as a team picking in the top five but also a team that could be in playoff contention. So this year, not a whole lot to be excited for, but a lot to watch for. I'm predicting 4-13, and 13, though. Okay, well, in, in lieu of my final thoughts, let's talk, Jason. What do you got for me? So this past week, or I guess it was last week now, the big talk around the Texas football program was the fact that Steve Sarkeesian would not release a depth chart. He just wouldn't do it. And the reporters and the beat and everybody who covered the team didn't get a depth chart until they arrived at the stadium three hours before kickoff, which is very unconventional. So I don't have much of an opinion on this because given like the, the amount of things that are available online, I feel like, you know, if I were covering that game, I would have looked up a million depth charts and kind of made my best guess. What what are your thoughts on that, mom, not being provided a depth chart? Do you think that teams have a duty to give the media that? Yes. Yes, I do. And there's a reason because as coach Marinelli said, you know, good questions come from knowledge. And when you are up front, you understand what the team is trying to do. You are able to ask better questions uh, and the fans want to be more informed. So the more you hold back, the there's no transparency. And not only are you holding that back from your players, my guess is he's trying not to upset a player. And that's why he did that. Uh, the whole thing when typically when coaches do that is to not give any kind of competitive advantage, which is so crazy because with social media today, you can easily find out who is most likely going to play, what position, how they've been doing in practice all week. So I find it, I find it silly. I don't like that. Uh, I think that you are really leading yourself into some uh, less educated reporters that might be covering the team, especially at the college level. So I think that's crazy. I think it's stupid. And I think it's uh, it's ignorant when they think that uh, they're pulling something over everyone's eyes by not releasing the depth chart. Well, do you want to hear what the excuse was? What? The excuse was that it fostered a the most competitive week of practice yet. 
as if those players didn't already know that they were starting or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us. I want to thank our guest, Rod Marinelli, former NFL defensive coordinator, former defensive coach. line coach and head coach in the NFL, uh, twice with the Bears. He was line coach and DC. Um, great to have him in his semi-retirement sounds to me like he might be back on the field next year. That's interesting. Very interesting. Uh, thank you so much to coach Marinelli for joining us. And also thank you to our producer back at ESPN Chicago, Jake Cantu, who puts everything together for us to get on the ESPN Chicago app. Please don't forget that that is our new home, the ESPN Chicago app. Follow us when you're on some long car rides, taking the dog for a walk, maybe waiting for the train when you go to work or walking to your classes. It's the ESPN Chicago app, our new home for the Sportscaster and Her Son podcast. Jason, what about YouTube? Very exciting. So you can still check us out on YouTube at the Sportscaster and Her Son. We've been doing very well on there, getting a lot of views. Don't forget to subscribe, like, rate. Do that everywhere that you listen to us, although you can't do it on the ESPN app. It doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, so YouTube is still very important. We post everything on there. That's where you get the video version. And secondly, we have a Twitter that I mentioned earlier in the show. And this time I'm going to get the acronym right. So it is TS. A H S pod T S A H S pod on Twitter. That's where I will be posting clips, previews, and then of course every show. Uh, so be sure to follow it. Lots of great content there. Lots of great up to the date once we drop new merch. Um, so be sure to stay tuned on there. And you can follow us on our individual pages at Peggy Kaczynski at Jason Canander. Also our Facebook page, the sportscaster and her son.com. Thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. Have a great NFL season. We'll be back here in a couple of weeks with a new episode of the sportscaster and her son. Have a great week, everybody. Happy new year, mom. You too, buddy. <laughs>